America's greatest Indian fighter, Randall Slidell McKenzie. <clears throat> you could also entitle America's, or uh, the most promising young officer. And I think that's kind of the poignant uh, gnome diploma for him I would uh, like, and we'll get into that in a moment. But uh, I've already talked about the Oklahomans we've got, by the way, the Oklahomans and my Civil War textbook. Uh, so we, um, that's my new historical novel, Dust Bowl of World War II. Oklahoma just came out a week ago, Short Grass. And then here's the war between the states, America's own Civil War. We've got that and the Oklahomans uh, $10 discount for you all today, Daughters of the Union Veterans, if, if you want those books. That's a one volume account, the causes, the events, and the consequences of uh, the Great War of the American States. Randall Slidell McKenzie. Question. Yes, ma'am. Do you know if Oklahoma history is required in high school still here in you know, it's, yeah, it's kind of a sad deal. Uh, there's one semester required, and uh, it's mostly taught in eighth grade now. So after that, uh, they don't get it. And I've actually had a uh, couple of members of the Oklahoma House of Representatives have been engaging me in conversations about when the second volume of our Oklahoma book comes out. Uh, utilizing that as a catapult to get it moved out to a full year course, possibly into the high school years. As you all know, these young people develop and by high school years, there's an opportunity to really retain the information. You can have them really understand the issues much more deeply and vigorously. Uh, I would want to continue having it in fourth grade and eighth grade, but uh, if you all have thoughts on that, let your state rep know. Uh, some of them are aware that this book is available now, Volume 1, but uh, it would be a great way to uh, not only teach state history, but I think uh, foster state pride. Thank you. Randall Slidell McKenzie uh, was born in Westchester, New York in 1840. He was the son of a U.S. Naval commander and the nephew of, of a United States Senator, John Slidell. Now this was an interesting character. He was a New York native also, but had moved to Louisiana as a young man and became uh, a very pro-Confederate politician in later years. And, uh, but he was uh, one of the numerous well-known uh, forebears of, of Randall McKenzie. McKenzie uh, finished first in the class of 1862 at West Point. So this was a young man who from early on was very determined, diligent, very talented. Then uh, upon graduation in the spring of 1862, he went immediately into service in the Union Army. And uh, that's quite a catalog of, uh, y'all don't mind, I'm going to turn these other lights out. <laughs> Quite a catalog, quite a resume of wartime service, isn't it? He served at Second Bull Run, Antietam, Gettysburg, the Overland Campaign, Petersburg, Cedar Creek, Five Forks, and Appomattox Courthouse. So even though he got into it a little bit late, he more than made up for it. He was Bremerton and or promoted seven times uh, as, as a young man, and keep in mind, he was 21 years old when he entered service in the war. Uh, at the time he entered the war, he was a second lieutenant uh, in the Corps of Engineers. Uh, two years later, uh, he had been moved up to colonel of the 2nd Connecticut Heavy Artillery. And then, um, actually I've got the date a little bit wrong there, it was officially 1865, but the orders from President Abraham Lincoln went through to Congress in November of 1864, Lincoln requesting them to approve McKenzie's promotion to Brigadier General of Volunteers. And in that somewhat uh, you know, versatile uh, role, uh, the latter months of the war, he commanded the cavalry of the Army of the James that was in a uh, pivotal position in the Richmond campaign. Next, please. And uh, in that campaign, and uh, among which battles Five Forks and Appomattox Courthouse, he was in command of that Army of the James Cavalry. This is what uh, Ulysses S. Grant said of Colonel McKenzie uh, after the war when he was doing his uh, post-war reports of the campaigns. Griffin, Humphreys, and McKenzie 
were good core commanders. Again, this is Grant speaking here. But they came into that position so near to the close of the war, Five Forks and Appomattox Courthouse, for instance, so as not to attract public attention. The sudden collapse of the rebellion monopolized attention to the exclusion of almost everything else. I regarded McKenzie as the most promising young officer in the Army. Graduating at West Point as he did during the second year of the war, he had won his way up to the command of a corps before its close. This he did upon his own merit and without influence. And if you all know much about McKenzie, he was a just a staunchly, if not brutally, forthright person. He did not seek to win friends and influence people. So I think that contributes to Grant's estimate that this was a this was a young man who did it on his merit, not because he curried favor with those in influence. Oh, did I mention he suffered six wounds in the war? At Bull Run, Gettysburg, Opaquan, Cedar Creek, and Petersburg. One of those, he got two wounds. I'm not sure which. <laughs> but yeah, there's five battles and six wounds. And he definitely got six wounds. Probably the most uh, famous of those was during the siege of Petersburg on Jerusalem Plank Road, uh, where he was seriously wounded, lost two fingers in one hand, and that gave him one of his fam one of his multiple famous nicknames uh, of Bad Hand. He was referred to a lot of times when people didn't like him as Bad Hand McKenzie. <laughs> uh, some of his uh, uh, subordinates called him the Perpetual Punisher during the war. Funny thing is, though, his peers, that is, those officers around him, which in that day and time a lot of times would be looked upon as, as opponents or adversaries for, for promotion and to high command, they had great respect for him, as did his superiors. But uh, there's kind of a poignant undercurrent uh, to this slide here, and we'll come back to it later, but these wounds, these were not just wounds that were shaken off. These wounds at least some of them stayed with him for the remainder of his life and they helped form and influence who he was and they helped determine his ultimate destiny on earth. Well, after the war, uh, he was sent out west and became one of the foremost white officers as far as his success in commanding African-American troops. Uh, Post-war, he was commanding the 41st, which uh, eventually became uh, the 24th Infantry Buffalo Soldiers. Uh, many of the white officers did not have success. They didn't like the role. Uh, they didn't connect with the black soldiers. McKenzie saw them as men who were wearing the blue uniform, and they were soldiers. They were to be commanded and led, and led well. And uh, he did a great job with them, uh, which led into the uh, sanguinary and historic Plains Indian Wars that, that ranged roughly 1867 to 1875. And of course, Alan, that's something that is a big part of our history out here. Um, the Plains Indian Wars ranged from uh, really, technically, you could say Mexico all the way to Canada and, and on an east-west uh, you know, a range of probably 1,500 miles. But there were certainly uh, pivotal theaters of the Plains Indian Wars, and in a lot of regards, my study has shown me that it could roughly be broken into, kind of like the Civil War, you could think of it as in the Eastern Theater of Virginia, Pennsylvania, and so forth, and the Western Theater of Tennessee and Kentucky and so forth. Uh, the Plains Indian Wars, uh, the Northern and Southern Theater, the Northern Plains uh, conflict uh, had such tribes as the, as the Northern Cheyenne, the, the, the Sioux, the Crow, the Blackfeet, and then the Southern Plains War uh, the United States engaged with would be the Comanche, the Southern Cheyenne, the Kiowa, the Arapaho. Um, but this was, uh, to give you an idea of the importance in Oklahoma history, uh, Edward Everett Dale, some of y'all are probably familiar with him if you have any connections to OU, uh, when you go to OU, you take freshman courses in Dale Hall. And then there's Dale Tower right behind that where most of the humanities professors uh, office. Edward Everett Dale was probably the, the dean of Oklahoma historians of any era. And he calls the uh, Battle of the Washita River 
which took place uh, in Roger Mills County, northwest Oklahoma. Uh, George Armstrong Custer uh, was in command against the Cheyenne, the most important conflict ever to take place in modern Oklahoma in the Plains Indian Wars, and it was a pivotal war. it was a pivotal battle. Uh, and again, I think modern historians are coming to realize uh, it's that's the type of battle where Custer would typically be like, well, it was a massacre of, of women and children. Well, that's funny. There were a couple of dozen Union soldiers, uh, federal soldiers, killed in that battle. Uh, there were plenty of Cheyenne warriors. There was one entire detachment of uh, U.S. Uh, soldiers that were wiped out. So, uh, uh, you know, the, the Plains Indian War, I think that kind of makes my point. This was a bloody and brutal war, and by the end of it, there was very little quarter taken on either side. Although McKenzie was an exception to that, which we'll get into in a moment. President Ulysses S. Grant, as he saw the brutal nature of how this was unfolding and as he uh, had a vision for the uh, tribes being able to be brought in and assimilated into the country, uh, he went to a policy, uh, what he called, or what was referred to as his peace policy, which used Quakers and other uh, Christian uh, ministers as kind of the forefront of reaching the Indians and actually using Quakers as their Indian agents in Indian territory. Uh, his Quaker peace policy, this is a picture from uh, uh, the, the era of uh, young Quakers and uh, young um, Native Americans in Oklahoma, but his goal was to win them over and to influence them and to be able to, to kind of uh, uh, relegate the battle uh, and the fighting um, the problem was, though, of course, there was a history, and uh, you know the Bible talks about sin begets sin, and, you know violence begets violence, and so what happened was while there were many well-intentioned uh, Quakers and federal uh, emissaries, ambassadors, Indian agents that were tr that were really working in a uh, in a uh, uh, helpful way with the tribes that by then had been uh, the Plains tribes had been. Uh, uh, put on reservations in western Oklahoma, as probably many of y'all from Oklahoma know. At the same time, uh, the uh, government realized that uh, the buffalo was the Indians' commissary. In other words, uh, the warrior tribes like the Comanches, uh, if they had buffalo, they would eat from the buffalo, they would make their weapons from the buffalo, they would produce their fuel and their energy from the buffalo. They would make their clothing. They would make their housing. Uh, they ate everything they needed. In our Oklahomans book, by the way, we have a diagram, a big color diagram of this same buffalo. But Bill Welge, who some of y'all may know, was the archivist at the Historical Society for many years, and then he was the head of the uh, Native American Research <laughs> Division. Uh, he actually, and he was hugely helpful to us in this book of uh, the Oklahomans, he actually goes in and he points in this diagram in our book each part of the buffalo body what the uh, natives were able to get from that portion of the buffalo. Well, so this was a war that was unfolding, and when the Comanches, for instance, or, or the Kiowa would go and uh, would hit the warrior trail, when they would range up into Kansas, or they would or they would blaze a path down into Texas and wipe out everybody, uh, men, women, children, babies. Uh, white, black, uh, other tribes, Mexicans, whoever they came across, uh, the, the government and then the military as its enforcement arm felt a lot of pressure. Uh, we have to make this safe. These, these settlers and then their representatives are turning the heat up on us so they realize if we kill the buffalo, that will basically unplug the power source for these warrior tribes. And that's why you have 30 to 40 million buffalo wiped out in the course of a few years. There were, there were, I think there were actually upwards of 50 million buffalo at the beginning of the mid-1800s. By uh, the late 1870s, there were maybe 500 buffalo still alive. Now, the Plains Indian War was eventually uh, focused on this uh, area referred to as Comancheria. And you can see the map here. Uh, basically, the western, most of the western half of Texas, western Oklahoma, western Kansas, eastern Colorado, eastern New Mexico, portions of Wyoming and Nebraska. But uh, it, it's somewhat equivalent to the, the Great Plains and ultimately where the Dust Bowl was. Okay, so 
Well, what are the common denominators there? Well, it was free range land. It was land where the Comanches, who are the great horsemen of history, could range. I mean, they could they could ride uh, they could ride on one mission a thousand miles, okay, and, and pick up what they needed along the way. That's that's how far they could travel. That's uh, the, the reason the Comanche ascended uh, to uh, hegemony among the tribes. The reason that when you see these movies where Apache chiefs like Geronimo and Cochise are fighting the United States Army in places like Arizona and Mexico and not Oklahoma or North Texas is because the Comanche ran them out of the short grass country. They ran them out of the southern plains. In fact, in the early 1700s, the Apaches and Comanches fought a war, and if the Apaches hadn't left, they were going to be exterminated. The Comanches learned to not just ride horses well, they learned to fight on their horses. The other tribes, they would dismount and fight. The Comanches would come right on. I think we've got a, uh, yeah, here it is, the Lords of the Plains. You can see this one. This was a George Catlin, the great 19th century American artist. Uh, this is a Comanche who is slung down on the side of his horse. And what he's going to do, he's in the process in this, in this picture, He's shooting his uh, arrow with his bow at a foe over his horse, but sometimes they would actually shoot it under the horse, okay? They'd be riding full throttle on that horse, and they could still get off 15 to 20 arrows per minute. Yeah. You think that was a, a uh, formidable adversary to come against? Uh, when, you're, when you're Randall Slidell McKenzie and you're going out into the wilds with blizzards and droughts and... Um, dust storms, and you've got these troopers, right, who, who are, are, are tired and, and complaining and all, and you don't know where these guys are at any given moment. And, and of course, you can imagine the, the Comanches were the masters of picking the place and time of battle they wanted when you least expected or wanted it. Uh, any of y'all read the book Empire of the Summer Moon? Highly recommend this to you. This is another great place to learn about Randall McKenzie and Quanah Parker, who I believe was the greatest warrior chief of any of the tribes in American history. S.C. Gwen, who actually works for the Dallas Morning News, is a, a writer now. He wrote that. It was nominated for the Pulitzer Prize a couple of years ago. And he just gets right down to it. He's not worried about offending anybody. He's very politically incorrect. If we massacre somebody, he says it. If they massacre somebody, he says it. And he uses the term demonic immorality to describe the behavior of the Comanches. They've got a prisoner there spread out. And uh, I have a quote in the Oklahomans that... Actually, go to the next screen and see if I... Yeah, here it is. This is a quote uh, of the time that somebody that was around the time described the Comanches, how they dealt with their prisoners. One by one, the children and young women were pegged out naked beside the campfire. These would be white prisoners or prisoners of other tribes, Mexicans, African Americans. Most of them were white in this part of the country. They were skinned, sliced, and horribly mutilated and finally burned alive by vengeful women. These were the Comanche women that did this. Determined to wring the last shriek and convulsion from their agonized bodies. Now that's disturbing, but I think it's important. And I think it's important for our young people to know, okay, that it's a good thing the Comanches lost and we want people. I'd much rather have the United States of America in charge of Oklahoma than the Comanche tribe, all right? And by the way, I have some great friends that are Comanches. I grew up in Duncan, Oklahoma. That's right on the border of the Chickasaw and Comanche. And I had numerous classmates, a couple of basketball teammates who were Comanches. They were great folks. But by gosh, that's what, what McKenzie was coming up against. This contemporaneous 19th century account, and this is in, uh, this is in our book, of female Comanche atrocities against white captives in Texas illustrates what one prominent chronicler of the tribe's history terms its systematic demonic immorality. That's prior to its subjugation by the U.S. Army and Texas Rangers. Demonic immorality toward its legion of captured adversaries, most of whom were actually other Indians or Mexicans. And again, it's important to recognize this because of all the voices that would say, well, it was just evil. You know, we, we, we took land from innocent people that weren't doing anything to us. 
Let me just tell you, there's a reason why when you see these movies or read the books, there's almost always uh, natives that are wearing the blue coat and scouting the United States Army, right? Have you ever thought why they are wearing that blue coat? Well, I got an up close and personal illustration of that one year. Uh, I've taught uh, history at Southern Nazarene University since 2006. And one year in the Oklahoma history course that they had me, me create and teach out there, uh, every time I mention the Comanches, and, and again, I, you can probably tell, I, I have a lot of admiration and respect for them, the Lords of the Plains. And again, I grew up around a lot of them. But every time I would mention the Comanches in kind of an admiring way, I noticed one of my female students would kind of get this look on her face. And she was a member of a tribe, a different tribe. She's Native American. But I started noticing this, so one, one, to one class period I thought, well, I'm going to purposely say something about the Comanches and look and see if I'm actually imagining this. So I, I said something about the great lords of the plains, and I looked over, and she just had this, this like, ready to just grind, you know, corn with her teeth. And I said, that's it. She, she looked at it, that's that look. Every time I mention the Comanches, you get that look on your face. And I said, you're a Native American. You know, what, what, what is it about the Comanches that's causing that expression? And she's kind of, you know, like this. And, and I said, no, really. I said, this, my classes are free fire zones, right? You can, you have an opinion, throw it out there. Just be ready to back it up. And she said, well, do you really want to know the truth? And uh, I, I honestly can't even remember what tribe she was a member of. I know it wasn't Comanche, though. And I said, yeah, I want to know the truth. Why do you apparently not enjoy mentioning the Comanche and she leaned across the desk at me and she said if the Comanche had done to your people what they did to mine you would hate them too this is what 2000 and probably 14 or 15 people have long memories the Comanches were equal opportunity offenders they had nothing that they did not take from some other tribe people Okay, they came down out of Wyoming. They had nothing down here that they did not kill, slaughter, rape, pillage, and move people off that land. Yes, ma'am. I thought they took uh, a lot of whites and whatever as slaves. They did. They did that as well. Cynthia Parker, uh, who was Quanta Parker's mother, mm -hmm. uh, they would take a lot of, uh, in particular, the, the young females, and they would, br quote, unquote, breed them. Okay, right. breed with them because their population was so small. Their form of life was so hard and brutal that their life expectancies were short. Mm -hmm. The mothers would die in childbirth. The infant mortality rate was was would skyrocket. So they needed uh, they needed mothers to produce more children, and that's pretty smart because maybe the greatest Comanche ever came from her and Peyton Nakona, who was a Comanche war chief. So uh, anyway, I probably talked a little bit more on that than I intended to, but uh, I just think we need to know the context that these guys came into. Uh, the United States did come into land that others were roaming on, but those roamers had taken that land by force from people before then. Blanco Canyon, 1871. This was kind of McKenzie's baptism under fire. This is when he was first assigned with the 4th Cavalry. Uh, to take on the Southern Plains tribes, which was the five bands of the Comanches, um, the uh, Southern Cheyenne, the Kiowa in particular, uh, he kind of got uh, his baptism by fire with Quanta Parker, who, among other things, came in and stole a bunch of his horses at night, even though he had guards on them, okay? This uh, set into motion a sequence of events. It was kind of some running battles and skirmishes where uh, Mackenzie came off better on that. He chased the Comanches away from where they'd been camped. But it was kind of a bloody nose to learn that, hey, and it was a learning process for him. Keep in mind, the year is 1871 here, okay? Three Fingers Jack, that was uh, another of his nicknames in addition to Bad Hand. <laughs> yeah, that's one of my favorites for him. Yeah. That's exactly right, yeah. It wasn't because he was a car dealer or anything. It was just, uh, but, uh, again, that Blanco Canyon and those events surrounding that were 1871. So, uh, in the time uh, from 1870 on moving forward, unlike other United States military commanders, 
McKenzie not only stayed and did not give up, did not look for a promotion somewhere else, did not seek a transfer to softer or safer <coughs> duty. Not only did he not do any of that, but unlike any commander before him or after, he studied his uh, adversary and determined to go where that adversary was and to learn what that adversary was about, what that adversary thought, what that, how that adversary operated. To paraphrase Will Rogers, uh, you can't know a guy until you walk, uh, the other fellow until you walk a mile in his moccasins. Well, McKenzie did everything but that. And in our book, The Oklahomans, we, we write that uh, Three Fingers Jack did not arrive at Palo Duro. Now, this was a climactic battle in eight, uh, end of 1874. This was more than three years after Blanco Canyon. So what had been going on during those three years? McKenzie had been out here. Oh, he had been in Indian Territory in Texas all that time, pursuing, having some battles, having some skirmishes, having some chases, losing people on both sides. Well, by the time you get to this climactic events at uh, Palo Duro Canyon out near Amarillo in the Texas Panhandle, as we write, he did not arrive at Palo Duro in the late 1874 unprepared or by chance. For years, he had intrepidly studied, pursued, and engaged the Comanches where no other American commander had. Across the vast and terrifying expanses of the Llano Estacado, if you all saw or read the book Lonesome Dove, that's where so much of Lonesome Dove takes place. The high plains of northwest Texas, the deepest sanctuary of Comancheria. Remember we looked at Comancheria earlier. That was where the Comanches would go back into after they had raided outside. Mackenzie had learned their tactics, their routes, their cycles of travel. Keep in mind, within their own home territory, their preferred redoubts, even their watering holes. He could travel from one end of Indian Territory or, or, or uh, Western Texas to the other, and he would, he would know where the water was because he'd figure out where the Comanche were watering their horses. He had winnowed down. Now, can you imagine how that would be important if you knew that your adversary had a, a source of water in a dry country? What do you think they did to those watering holes? Poison. Exactly. Poison. Yeah. Kill the buffalo, poison the water. You're, you're, that's, those are game changers, okay? That, McKenzie was using his head. He was, not, he was not doing like a Russian or Nazi or Japanese imperial deal where he would just throw waves of men. He was trying to conserve his manpower. He used his head. He used his brain more than his brawn. Between 1871 and 1874, he had winnowed down the Comanche's manpower during a host of, of skirmishes and battles including his stunning 1872 ambush of them at the Battle of the North Fork of Red River near present-day La Forest, Texas. That audacious feat included the capture of one and possibly two of Quanah Parker's seven wives and the virtual destruction of the Comanche's Kutsutika Band. We don't think of that, do we? That, wow, the United States uh, cavalrymen ambushing Comanches? You know, jumping them, surprising them, that is not taught in this day and time. By, by the end of these Plains Indian Wars, that's what McKenzie was doing. He had learned their craft and bested them at it. Now, this was, for the final campaign, what was called the Red River War. This was the, the, the climactic uh, chapter of the Southern Plains Indian Wars, 1874, 1875. Uh, there were five columns of... Uh, th th this was after um, uh, the Comanches had gone on a particularly gruesome uh, trail of vengeance that ranged from southern Colorado to south Texas, wiping out every American settler, man, woman, child, baby, that they came across. A couple of hundred of them in one summer. So finally, the American people back east and the government and the railroad said, that's enough. Take, you know, deal with this situation. And so they did. Uh, uh, president Grant was the president uh, still. Uh, and then you're going to see the line up here in a moment who led them. But five columns of cavalry, infantry, and artillery marched out of four different states and territories, Texas, Indian Territory, Kansas, and New Mexico, uh, converging on the deepest recesses of Comancheria. Uh, around Palo Duro Canyon, Texas Panhandle. 
William Tecumseh Sherman, next please. Philip Sheridan, that's his great uh, rally at uh, Cedar Creek. Nelson Miles, you, you guys know who all, all that, uh, all those uh, famous men are. Men that won the Civil War, and it's the same lineup that wound up winning the Plains Indian Wars, which was what opened up the American West to the settlement of our forefathers. Next. And among the uh, groups they used, the 9th uh, and 10th uh, Cavalry, one based in Indian Territory, modern Oklahoma, one in Texas, that were Buffalo soldiers, African Americans. Many of those guys had fought for the Union Army in the war between the states. That's another painting. We have all, these, all this artwork is in our Oklahoma's book. And the Texas Rangers. They had finally managed to get back in the saddle. You know, the, the, the U.S. government, they... They, one of the first things they did after the Civil War was disband the Texas Rangers. <laughs> Thought, man, you know, we don't want these guys, uh, you know, organized for any mayhem. Well, finally, uh, in 1874, uh, they were reconstituted. And they wasted no time, guys that look just like that, in uh, uh, running uh, reconnaissance, uh, in patrolling, in cutting off uh, escape routes and other duties in support of those five columns of the United States Cavalry, Infantry, and Artillery. This is a shot at some of the major battles. There were between 14 and 20 uh, throwdowns between the Plains tribes uh, and the U.S. Army, uh, mostly in the Panhandle of Texas uh, in 1874 and 1875. You can see where all those took place. This was a serious campaign, people. I mean, there, there was lots of shooting, lots of fighting, lots of people killed. And this was the climactic showdown. Palo Duro Canyon. Have any of y'all ever been there? Yeah. yeah, isn't it magnificent? It's, it's gorgeous. Yeah. Second largest canyon in North America behind Grand Canyon. How could you ride a horse on that? How could you ride a horse? You're going to hear that in just a minute. <laughs> and this is another reason why. Why does every American school child not know the name and story and legacy of Randall Slidell McKenzie? Because nobody else in our history did the things that he did. That is exactly, that was the battleground. That's, that, would that not make sense if you were the Comanches and their you know, Southern Shine and Kiowa allies as the place you would go to hide out, right? Uh, you've heard of the, Com the Comancheros. There was a famous John Wayne movie some years ago. And I'm almost done, just about three more minutes or we'll be finished. Um, this was a place that nobody could get to, okay, except the Comanches and their allies. Well, uh, Mackenzie got there. Mackenzie went on a 12-hour night march across this country. He had Comanches that actually knew where he was and were trailing him. He lost them. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I didn't learn that one high school history. He left them behind somewhere. He, he got away from his Comanche scouts, got to the uh, entrance to Paladuro Canyon, and uh, at, at, it was still dark. Did I mention that 12-hour deal? Most of that was at black midnight darkness. Got there undetected. A Comanche uh, war chief, Red Warbonnet, uh, spotted them uh, and and was killed by a, a, an army sharpshooter before he could generally uh, alert his colleagues. And Mackenzie led his uh, approximately 600 troopers, and he had a couple hundred Tonkawas, who talk about pure hate between the Tonkawas and the Comanches. The Comanches killed, raped, murdered Tonkawa women and children. Tonkawas would kill Comanches and eat them. They were accused of cannibalism, and it was a, a proper accusation at times. These people hated each other. So the Tonkawas wrote, but Mackenzie took his force, several hundred strong, one horse at a time down this narrow trail. You just saw what Paladuro Canyon looked like. He took them hundreds of feet almost straight down this narrow buffalo trail. Wow. If you were the Indians, you think anybody's going to follow you down there? Mackenzie did. And, and once again, ambushed them, caught them totally flat-footed, unexpecting. And uh, it was such a rout that the, the, the Indians were barely able to mount enough of a defense to let their women and children get away. Now, Mackenzie, a notable thing about him, he did not, he did not to my research, I have not found any evidence that he ever allowed uh, in any way counseled uh, the harm of noncombatants, women and children. Uh, they would capture them, they would take them to uh, uh, the reservation, Fort Sill, wherever, 
but uh, he would not harm them. And that set him aside from his opponents and many on his own side. But this was a route that took place for several miles. That canyon is enormous, okay? Well, uh, back up. Well, I'm sorry. One there, there's a great sequence in our Oklahoma's book, and it talks about how they get to the end of this, of this chase, and the Comanches get up to the top of this one area of the canyon. They're 800 feet to 1,000 feet up high, shooting down in a circle, got, got McKenzie's men surrounded. And at least one of the troopers, or the eyewitness account, said, you know, was screaming, how are we ever going to get out of here? And McKenzie just cool and calm said, I got you in here, I will get you out. And then he leads this audacious charge up the walls of the canyon and, and scatters the tribes out into the open plains. And did I mention that he scattered them without their horses because the army got their 1,400 horses and I love horses, and it's an awful thing, but by then, McKenzie had learned the hard way. If you don't kill their horses, they will come back and kill your women and children. Okay? He'd actually captured horse herds before, and then the Comanches would ambush them and take the horses back. So he had a bunch of his troopers, including some of those Buffalo soldiers, and they had a massacre of these 1,400 horses and ponies. But what happened was within a few months, all those tribes had come on foot to surrender into Fort Sill, or modern-day Lawton, even Quanah Parker. That was it. And they say there's a legend, you can still hear these ghostly uh, echoes of these horses screaming and crying in the canyons of Palo Duro at night. Okay, that's the book I talked about, uh, Empire of the Summer Moon. I cannot recommend a book more highly. I don't know what happened to that. Oh, I know what it was. Um, so, Quanah Parker comes in. McKenzie actually sent other Comanches to appeal to Parker to come in, okay? Because Parker only had probably 40 warriors left with him and a few, you know, a few women and children, and he appealed to him. Quanah Parker comes in. Uh, rather than dealing with him in any way, and this was a man who had led raids, who had killed soldiers and lots of other people, McKenzie, and this is where he goes from being a great warrior to, to a great man. He extends the olive branch, and he not only befriends Parker, forsakes punishing him, but he begins to mentor him. Okay, as kind of a big brother. He was eight years older than Parker. And he taught him the ways. This is in Empire of the Summer Moon, uh, finalist in the Pulitzer Prize uh, contest. He taught him the ways of American society and culture, how to sit down and eat at the table, how to interact with people. So within a few years, Quanta Parker has become a successful entrepreneur. Okay, this was a, a brilliant man. He was a big man. He was a big, strong man like Peyton Nakona, his father. And he was a handsome and brilliant man like Cynthia Parker. And did I mention his mother? Her family founded the first Protestant church in Texas. Okay? This was a, a Texas dynasty that he came from on one side and then a Comanche uh, chiefs on the other. So within a few years, Parker is not only uh, excelling as an entrepreneur, but he's also dealing with American federal agents all the way into Washington to secure better land deals, better cattle grazing rights and prices from the government to put their cattle and private uh, cattlemen's uh, herds on Comanche reservation land so the, the tribe can make more money. Uh, he founded a school system, an American school system within the Comanche nation for his people. He's actually the school superintendent for a while. Okay, <laughs> I say that because this is a measure of the greatness of McKenzie. He saw the big picture. He loved America. And he wanted what was best for our country. And what was best for our country was for people like Quanta Parker and the Comanches to come into it and be productive members of it. And that's uh, Parker in later years. Well, what about McKenzie? So he's commander of Fort Sill uh, after the, the Red River War. And then uh, Custer and the 7th Cavalry get, get massacred at the Little Bighorn River Valley, uh, summer of 1876. By that point... The government and the army, there was only one person they felt like was capable of dealing with the crazy horses and the sitting bulls. I mean, George Armstrong Custer was no small army 
uh, commander, right? I mean, the guy was tremendously successful in the Civil War. He had won big and important battles in the Plains Indian Wars, and he gets massacred to a man uh, with the 7th Cavalry. So basically, in my opinion, is kind of the last ditch, like the Hail Mary pass. Let's get Randall McKenzie and the 4th Cavalry up from Oklahoma to deal with the Northern Plains tribes, okay? So that's the aftermath, November of 1876, uh, after uh, the 4th Cavalry has defeated the Northern Cheyenne, okay, Dull Knife. And by the way, McKenzie's reputation was such that Dull Knife, who was probably the most famous uh, Cheyenne chief at that, of that generation, certainly in the North, uh, he, he said later, he told McKenzie, he said, you were the one I was worried about when I heard you were coming up here. And sure enough, they ambushed the Cheyenne at daybreak in their own camp and, and uh, dismantled them. Well, shortly after that, he defeated Crazy Horse and the Lakota Sioux. So he ended the Black Hills War uh, and the Sioux, uh, Great Sioux Uprising in the mid to late 1870s. Randall uh, Slidell McKenzie uh, led the United States to victory in both the Southern Plains Indian Wars and the Northern Plains Wars against the greatest warrior tribes, Cheyenne, Kiowa, Northern and Chey uh, Southern Cheyenne, uh, Sioux, Arapaho. Well, then after that, he goes on from a triumph to triumph. Uh, he is like, uh, what would you call it, the, the, the designated hitter when there was a real tough situation that no one else could handle. Uh, the government, Grant, Sherman, and these guys would call McKenzie. 1878, it's McKenzie that puts down the uprising of Indians in Mexico that were coming across the border, probably either Apaches or Kickapoos or maybe both. 1879, the Apaches in New Mexico. 1880, the Utes in southern Colorado. 1882, uh, other Apaches and Navajos uh, in New Mexico. Actually, uh, that earlier one was uh, in Arizona. So you have Arizona, Colorado, New Mexico, Mexico. All across uh, the western North America, uh, it was McKenzie that would go and within a few uh, months, if not weeks, would put down the uprisings. And that makes it all the more remarkable. Uh, I don't know if any of you all know, but on the one hand, part of why I showed the, uh, the great uh, ascendance of Quanta Parker in his final years. Uh, and by the way, Quanta Parker was responsible for allowing the Mennonites, the most peace-loving, peaceful, pacifistic, perhaps of all the Christian church denominations, he allowed them to come in and set up a mission station on the Comanche Reservation to minister to one of the most warrior-like tribes in history. And the Mennonites generally led the Comanche tribe to Christianity between the 1890s and the 1920s. And I've actually attended the church, Post Oak uh, Mennonite Church, that's down by India Homa, between India Homa and Cash. It's still meeting. Uh, is still largely comprised of Comanches. I've eaten Indian tacos with them after those services. So Quanta Parker let the Christian church, uh, American educational system, free enterprise, uh, entrepreneurial business opportunities, he was the man that was the vanguard in leading all of those into the Comanche nation. Meanwhile, Randall McKenzie, after all these great triumphs, all through that career, remember we talked about those wounds, those grievous wounds he had? Didn't even mention he had at least one bad wound uh, against the Comanches. He got an arrow that went through his shoulder. He was in horrible pain. He was in such pain from that wound, he asked his men to kill him there on the field. He was suffering so much. So he had been irascible. He had obviously been in pain all through all those years on, on the, in the southwestern plains from the cumulative effect of these wounds. Well, his behavior in the uh, uh, early, around 1883, 1884, becomes erratic. It becomes, uh, he begins drinking, which he had not done. He was a teetotaler through all those years. Uh, he begins seeing a woman. They, they said he hardly uh, ever had a date, hardly ever was seen in the company of a woman during all of his uh, military career. Uh, and then he begins to just act very strangely. To, to the point where he was committed, he was declared insane by United States military uh, medical personnel and, and put in the Bloomingdale Asylum in New York City, not far from where he was born. 
And uh, he had gotten to the point where he could not even write, and when he would speak, it was like a, a, a little baby or a toddler. Wow. What year was that? He went in there. Uh, 1884, I believe. And he didn't die until... At the age of what? At 44. 43 or 44. Wow. wow. Yeah. And he didn't die for another five years. Wow. wow. Which they said that uh, one of the commentators at the time said that... Uh, he lived a living death the final years of his life. He, he actually resided at his sister's home in New Jersey the, the final period of his life and, and died there. So it, it's an incredible, incredibly provocative and searching question. What happened to Mackenzie? There are all sorts of um, theories. One that's been floated, especially in recent years, oh, he got syphilis. He went crazy. He was like Al Capone. That's pitiful. If anybody ever says that, just know they've got a neon sign their forehead flashing saying, I am a jackass. I don't know what I'm talking about. Okay. Mackenzie was a straight arrow guy. Okay. He did not mess around like that. Uh, toward the end of his life, there was a woman that he wanted to marry, but then that didn't happen because of his condition. But he, he just was not that sort of person. The United States uh, military records, there was never a, a case of him being treated for anything remotely uh, related to syphilis or anything like that. But th there was also a well, he got bad sunstroke when he was a child. Maybe it was a uh, manifestation of that. In my opinion, uh, the best theories, he, he had a bad fall when he was commander at Fort Sill in 1875, just months after uh, the great victory at Paladuro Canyon. He was in a wagon somehow. It wasn't because he was drinking, I promise you, not at that point. But he fell on, on his head. <laughs> and he was seriously injured for a period of days. He was in bad shape. He got some kind of a bad concussion. So there was speculation, well, maybe that was a brain, that was brain damage that, that gradually worsened because today it could be treated, back then it couldn't. How about PTSD? Have you all learned enough about McKenzie and what he dealt with uh, all those years, all those wounds? I mean, I think that's a, a, a valid... Yeah. And then uh, poisoning, lead or metal poisoning. I mean, who knows what all ordnance he had in his body streaming around literally. Well, the Indians could put stuff on the arrows. Yeah, they would poison tip their arrows sometimes. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of, uh, I think, uh, and it could just be a combination of these things. Something clearly went wrong with McKenzie. This was a good and great man. This was a true patriot. So uh, to me, this, this is an Oscar-winning film waiting to happen at some point if some the right people could get hold of it. So in conclusion, there he is. What's that? Oh, he's a, a handsome man. Very handsome. Especially when you consider all the punishment his body took. Uh, this was a quote. Uh, the New York Times, by the way, his home native state, uh, barely had a mention upon his death. It just mentioned, I've read the... Uh, uh, the little blurb in their paper when they found out he died, it just basically said, you know, Randall Slidell McKenzie, native of Westchester, died on such and such date. He was a Brigadier General, blah, 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 blah. It was just not even a paragraph. But the Army and Navy Journal got a little closer. In their, in their uh, obituary for him, they wrote, the sorrow with which the Army will learn of the death of the once brilliant Randall Slidell McKenzie derives an additional pain from the recollection of the cloud which overshadowed his later years and consigned him to a living death. Wow. The most promising young officer. And to me, I don't know, I was just moved this week after Memorial Day because Randall McKenzie, uh, he was a martyr for our country. I mean, clearly, he died from battle, right? The, the things he did for the good of this country is what led to his death. So I think he's as deserving as anyone else to be honored specifically on Memorial Day. Mm -hmm. Where's he buried? What's that? Where's he buried? Yeah, maybe in New Jersey. It's either New Jersey or, or his sister's home was in New Jersey. So it's, it's you could probably find it. It's up near you, Ellen, somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> you ought to find that, do a little filter. Yeah. Up Report back to us. Okay, we're <laughs> But there he is, a colorized version, blue-eyed, handsome guy, um, and a real American patriot. Did he ever have any children? 
No, he was never married. He loved this woman. He had bought a uh, property in Bernie, Texas, down near San Antonio. But uh, his affliction overcame him before he was able to. Uh, and uh, they said that she never uttered a word about him after he departed. So how I have one question when he died. Yes. He was for, uh, would have been either 48 or 49 when he died. Uh, yeah, the question. The question I have is, uh, I know that after the Civil War, you know, the North went up and the South, you know, went back down. But during the Indian Wars and after that, the U.S. Army did it consist of mainly Union troops, or was or were the Confederate troops that, that joined it also as well? Yeah, great question. Uh, the post-war uh, <laughs> Army of the West, basically. Uh, were the, was it all Union or, or Confederate as well? I'll tell you a great book that I learned a lot on that pr- particular topic. Have you all ever heard of the book uh, Crimsoned Prairie by S.L.A. Marshall? He was a World War II uh, mil- uh, artillery commander, I believe, for the United States in, in World War II. He, he wrote this book in the 70s. Uh, it's, but you can get it, uh, I'm sure, uh, as I did, used on Amazon or Barnes & Noble, Crimson Prairie. And he addresses that specific topic. And he says, kind of like the old John Ford Cavalry movies, remember? They would have John Wayne and Ward Bond. They'd have the, the Union officers and the Irish non-coms, you know, then the conscripts from everywhere. And then there would always be a Ben Johnson or somebody that was the Johnny Reb. Oh, yeah. So I think that was very, there, there was a minority of, of, of Confederate veterans that um, were heartbroken. Many of their lands had been destroyed. There was nothing left for them in the South. They would go west and for a paycheck. And because they were Americans, they would join up. And some of the best uh, scouts uh, in the cavalry, probably no surprise, were, were Confederate veterans. Were Confederates? Yes. I was just wondering about that. Yeah. Oh, and um, Brigadier General McKenzie is buried in West Point, New York, at the wow. West Point Cemetery in West Point, New York. I've been there. Wow. I he was there. That's in the wow. old section. Yeah, yeah the old, that, look, look, old section looks right over the river. Yeah. Really? Hudson River. Yeah, really pretty, yeah. There you go. I think that's the reason that you should take me to New York. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. I've never been to New York. No, okay. And I, I, told I, wanted I, to go. I said I wanted to go before I was 50, but I'm 55, so now I'm going to say before I'm 60, you should take me to New York. Oh uh, yeah, okay. Well, Ellen, do you know where Cornwall on Hudson is in New York? Have you ever heard yeah, of that? Yeah, it's on the Hudson River. Yeah, yeah it's uh, well, our, uh, not because far from West Point, though, is it's it? It's not. Yeah, and okay. the man who for twenty over 20 years has designed and all the graphics work of our books lives at Cornwall on Hudson, New York. Oh. We've never met him. We've never met him in you person. Were, oh, there's another reason. I was yeah. going to say, we've worked <laughs> with him online and his computers for 25 years. Yeah, 25 years. Oh, yeah. I've never met him, and he's getting ready to move. I think. Yeah. <laughs> so we need to go. Go to West Point and go visit. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you all for having us. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs>